In Matthew 15, verses 12 to 14, we read, Then came his disciples, that is, Jesus' disciples, and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone, they be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Today I'd like to talk to you about giving up, about giving up for God. Many people are uh, very, very determined. And depending on what we're doing, determination is a great asset to have. I think I learned a lot of determination when I joined the military. In fact, uh, there were those people that said, it changed my life, it changed the way I was. I was a very mediocre worker, and then in the things I did after that, you know, I was much more dedicated. So that kind of training worked well, and dedication is good, but within Christianity, there is a limit to that dedication, you see, because we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, and the work is not ours, it is, but it is God's. We have to know the difference between striving in the flesh and just simply, humbly following the Lord. And he wants us to have peace. He doesn't want us to do a lot of striving. And here we read in this passage from Matthew, Jesus is saying, leave them alone. Sure, I offended them, but leave them alone. How many times would it be for us if we offended someone as we were witnessing to them in any capacity? Now, most of the time today, I'm going to be talking about you know, witnessing for salvation, which is the typical way that we would think of interacting as Christians with non-believers or, let's say, professed believers who may or may not actually know the Lord. Uh, however, it could be in anything that the Lord directs us to do. The work is really His, and we have to trust Him for that. Remember that in Luke 17, 10, Jesus said that when you have done all these things that I've commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants and have done that, which is our duty to do. It's a simple verse that I use quite often. And so we see that in Scripture, it's actually a pretty strong point that God is making when he says, don't strive, let go. For example, we're going to see in Jeremiah. Now, I want you to know again that all of these scriptures I have listed in the description below. They're there at your leisure to look at. Hopefully I've gotten them all, but I have to go through this a little more quickly for the, for the video. Three times in Jeremiah, Jesus is saying, pardon me, I'm sorry, whoops, Jesus wasn't here yet in the flesh. Although we take the entire word of God to be from him, he is the living word. But God is saying here to Jeremiah, pray not for this people for their good. And uh, so in Jeremiah 7, 16, for example, we read, therefore pray not, Pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. And yes, that is likely, uh, you know, the, the Holy Spirit working on Jeremiah. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. I'm trying to vindicate myself because I had that little slip there. But you see what it is. And there are two other scriptures in Jeremiah that say that as well, about not praying for the people. Uh, there's one that says about not returning to the people. They can come to you, but don't you go back to them. And so there's really a point at which the Lord is saying, you know, it's time for you to stop. Now, some might say, okay, that's Jeremiah, but that's in the Old Testament. We don't do that anymore. Now we're in the New Testament. But with Jesus, as I had just read in the opening, it was the same thing. There are limits that he puts on how much effort we're supposed to be putting into something. For this, you might remember uh, the different times in the Gospels when Jesus said to shake the dust from your feet when you're leaving a town. I'm just going to read this one from Luke chapter 10, verses 10 and 11. But into whatsoever city you, you come, and they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of this city and say, The very dust of your city which cleaves to us we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. So you understand, if they are not receiving us, nor, they are re nor are they hearing the words that we're speaking, we're supposed to move on. And that is not easy for some of us. We want to see a result. But the scripture is telling us, no, you may not see the result. 
even that scripture I listed as far as uh, that we are unprofitable servants, I really take that for the most part that Jesus is saying, you may not see it. And you may not see it immediately. There's two different things. You may see it later on down the line, or you may not. But a lot of times you may see it. I think the Lord does it. He lets us see it enough to encourage us. But other than that, we need to take it by faith and simply do what he has told us to do. And so again, I have these various scriptures. I have uh, four scriptures here where it's talking about shaking the dust from your feet. Just so you know, it is not only the Old Testament, but it is the New Testament as well. Now here I want to say, what are the reasons why God might have us walk away from something? I mean, he's got to have his reasons. And I guess, strictly speaking, I can't, uh, I can't say every instance of what God is doing in your particular case. That's going to have to be between you. The Holy Spirit will be uh, interceding and, and telling you what uh, the Lord wants for you. But there are several reasons here that I can think of. And these are not in any particular order, but reasons why the Lord may want you to walk away or, or quit at a point. It doesn't mean that he is done. Okay, number one, I have not to waste time. Even uh, I have here listed Ephesians 5, 16, you know, redeeming the time for the days are evil. I think there's also a reference directly to that in Colossians. And so the Lord doesn't want us to squander time. So much so that even like with Jeremiah, he's saying, pray not for the people. So he's even saying, not only don't keep witnessing to them, but he's saying, don't pray for them either. Don't waste time. And uh, if you'll remember that Jesus also said in his ministry, he said that you will not have finished going through all the cities of Israel before the Son of Man come. In other words, there are plenty of people out there that need to be testified to. So don't squander time on what, uh, at least as far as you're concerned, is a finished work. It may be a lost cause. We'll let God be the determiner of that. Number two, the work is someone else's. In 1 Corinthians 3, I think it's verses 5 through 7, you're seeing how Paul is writing that uh, I planted, Apollos watered, but God brought the increase. He's just saying that there was a different work for himself and for Apollos. They are different members of the body of Christ. And so in other words, you may be finished with the part that God wants you to do. And so it's just time to move on and not try to overextend your reach. Another reason, number three I have, is you could compromise faith. And this I see in two ways. Number one is where you are being yoked together with unbelief. Only too many times I find that Christians today are compromising their faith in order to reach someone. Instead of standing for their principles, they end up compromising. They're becoming yoked together with unbelief. And in this they say, well, you know, I'm trying to reach so-and-so, you, know, you know, for the Lord. But instead they end up in bad fellowship. And uh, they might end up compromising things they don't want to. This could also lead to out-and-out -out sin. In 1 Corinthians 15, 33, it says, bad company corrupts good morals. It really could lead to sin because you're in a sinful setting. By the nature of your flesh, you will be prone to sin. You're not supposed to hang around with sinners. They are not your company. Sure, we go into the world and we testify for the Lord. But this is not the fellowship that we are to have. And good things will not come from that. Number four, salvation is of God. We re remember from... Uh, the parable, it's not a parable, I'm sorry, the story of the rich young ruler. Here I have listed Mark 10, 26 and 27. The disciples are asking who can be saved. And Jesus says that with men it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. So salvation is a work of God. We see it again in John chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. I'll, I'll uh, mention that again in a moment. We are not the ones that save. We are only the ones that bring the message. God has to do the work himself directly on the heart. It is a miracle. Number five, I just have to avoid frustration. From Ephesians 4.27, it says, don't give place to the devil. Well, we avoid frustration. We're frustrated because, you know, whatever we're saying or doing doesn't seem to work. That's, uh, 
very, it is frustrating to say the least. Satan is the accuser of the brethren, and he condemns also, doesn't he? And this is something where we, we take ourselves out of that situation where we're listening to the accuser say, oh, if you'd have only done this, oh, if you just would have talked differently, oh, you lost your temper there, you shouldn't have done that. He is the accuser, and he condemns. But we are justified through Jesus Christ, and uh, he has overcome that accuser. So we shouldn't hang around when it's not our time. It's just going to lead to frustration and probably discouragement for further works that the Lord wants to do. I just wanted to mention this also. Again, this is along the lines of of auto. This is along the lines of salvation. Salvation is being of the Lord. Remember that all must be born again. And we don't know where the spirit comes from. It's like the wind. We don't know where it's coming from. Don't know where it's going to. This is John chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. And it's, so this is how it is with salvation. We just don't know how the spirit is working. Uh, there's this uh, wonderful missionary that I like to listen to sometimes. His name is Otto Koenig. I have his name listed in the description. And he, he has some wonderful stories. He's a, a good storyteller. One of my favorites is the pineapple story. Uh, I'm not sure, sure which uh, story this is from that I'm going to share. It might be from the snake story. But he had this idea. There was a, a man in the tribe. He was a missionary in New Guinea. And there was a man in this tribe he was missionary to who was a real leader. And he got the idea, if this person could just be converted, he would be such a natural leader to the rest of the people. And they could see a great revival in this tribe. So he really dedicated a lot of prayer and fasting, you know, over this man. Also, when he went home on furlough, he was passing his picture around. Okay, he was, he was giving out flyers. He was getting prayer commitments from churches he was in. You know, I, I, it's it's not ridiculous. It's this dedicated. This this is dedicated. I mean, I understand this, but you know something? That man never got saved. He never did. You know, God wants everyone to get saved, but He says very few will be saved. And it's not that He didn't want him to. I really believe this is a matter of a person's free will. He's God knows that there is a place. There's kind of a bound. He's not going to overstep that bound where He's taking away the person's right to choose Him. That's what he wants. He wants a voluntary relationship with people. He's not going to force it. And this is a very important uh, lesson to remember. And even with this, this native that he was witnessing to, there was a pretense. Okay, get it. There was a pretense of salvation, but there was never any change. Those who were truly converted near him said, no, it doesn't matter what he said. He was only saying those things, Otto, to keep you happy. Uh, he really hasn't changed in the life that he's living. And so just remember that salvation is of the Lord. And this is, uh, we have to trust him with that. If it were just a matter of us praying, 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 then somewhere that would be in scripture to, uh, you know, pray in a dedicated way over every soul and they all would come to him. But they don't. They really don't. And so it is a mystery to this. But God wants that freedom of relationship for, with each person on their own. There's another good scripture I'd like to share with you. Uh, this is something the Lord has pointed out to me, kind of addresses the same matter. Uh, I might tell you, though, also, uh, there's a similar one. Do I have this written down? Okay, I have it sitting, written down. It's from the parable of the sower, where the seeds that are the word of God fall on the wayside, and they are immediately gobbled up. Satan comes and takes that seed away, so the person won't be saved. They won't even hear the word at all. But listen to this from Psalm 58, verses 3 through 5. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear, which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, charming never so wisely. Guess what? It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter how you speak. Some of these are like the deaf adder. It doesn't matter what you say. They will not hear. They will not be charmed. And the Lord has shown me a number of people like this. Remember also, perhaps from 
uh, the rich man and the beggar Lazarus in Luke 16. Jesus was telling this, and this was a real story. And the testimony which came actually through Abraham at that time, it said he said that if they have Moses and the prophets, and they have not heard Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rose from the dead. And you know who that was an allusion to, of Jesus yet to come and rise from the dead. So understand, there is a time, brethren, to walk away. I can't tell you when that is. But uh, one good way, the Spirit will usually be telling you somehow that it's time. And one good way that you might know is simply that in sticking it out, when things are really seeming bump, bumpy, rocky, the person's not receiving, maybe you're starting to make compromises in other areas of your spiritual journey that you really shouldn't make. And if that's happening, then that could be a good indicator. It's time to move on. I can't tell you when that is, but I trust that uh, good advice could help lead you into prayer so God can take you that way. I hope that the Lord will make this message a blessing to you. Have a good day.